Good morning, Sal. How you feeling? Good. We're good looks here like, today. <laughs> looks like you got the scarf on and the Christmas tree in the, yeah, the, the back. Yeah, the Christmas tree's behind me. Yeah, with Christmas spirit, huh? <laughs> we're getting ready for the season, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's about that time. And, you know, we got a really interesting story today that we're going to be going into detail about, about the heist that Tommy DeSimone had turned down from you and it's a pretty long one, extensive. So, yeah. <clears throat> you know, anybody listening, you know, just kind of hold your questions till the end and we'll get to them because Sal might answer it along the way while he goes into detail. There's a lot of detail to the story. It, so It's kind of interesting because I thought about this and it's 50 years ago next week Damn. that we talked about this robbery. That's a long time ago. Yeah, but I <laughs> clearly remember... Um, how I got the information um, in the beginning four years earlier, 1969 Cataldo Donnelly and Funzi Terracone, they somehow got information about a truck and they hijacked it and it was loaded with watches. And the interesting thing about that was they had the watches put away like in a little warehouse. And the set one day after they did the heist, our attorney got a hold of Cataldo and Donnelly and Terracona said, hey, look, uh, somebody saw the car you were using on the heist. I don't know. It might have been Funzie's car. And we're going to arrest Funzie. Oh, they got paranoid. Funzie was still on parole from the 1960s. You know, he was in federal, federal prison. And so they got nervous. And then Taldo said to the attorney, well, what can we do? He says, look, I got this corrupt detective. I'm going to go meet with him. So when he came back, he said, look, if you give the watches back, nobody will get arrested. You got to give it all back because the insurance company, you know, knows it's a lot, a lot of money. In those days, it might have been like, I don't know, a quarter of a million dollars. That's 50 years ago. It was a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. So they made an agreement to give, load it up in the truck and give it back. Well, what Cataldo Donnelly and Funzy did, they sifted through the watches and took out a whole load of good ones. <laughs> then they went to return the truck. And I remember them telling me it was right near the Queens Criminal Courthouse. And they dropped the truck off there with the key inside, left it there. And they backed away and they were sniping on the cops. When the detectives pulled up, they had a little truck and they started taking cases out of, of the truck that Cataldo and Donnelly and Terracone gave over to them. So they both stole some of the watches before they went back to the insurance company. But nothing ever ha nothing ever came out of it. Nobody was arrested. And that was the story in 1969. They didn't tell me all of that until years later. But it was Christmas of 73. And we were at a party at a place I was hanging out. This Club 93. Incidentally, the bartender was Cookie. I'm sorry, Angela, her name was. Oh, Angela Tommy's was girl. married to Tommy D. Simone. She was the bartender there. And there was a drunken guy that was there, and I used to talk to him. He was the driver for this particular company, SH Pomerantz. And in his drunken stupor, he gave me all the details about the watches were in that building. So that was like around Christmas time. So then a week or two, three weeks later, I said to Foxy, let's go look at this building. So we went over to the airport. We found the building. It was all fenced in. It had a security, you know, gate and everything, a guard there. And I said, I bet you we can, you know, we can heist the building. So then I told Tommy about it. And Tommy was doing a lot of coke at that point. And uh, he, we took him to show him, you know. But we had to get over there early in the morning every morning. We had to watch the people go in. Then we had to be there on Tuesday to watch the customs inspectors to come they had to go through all the watches that came from switzerland and approve them and put custom stickers on all the cases so tommy didn't want to get up he was doing a lot of cocaine you want to get up in the morning so after about a week or two i said look you're not going to come forget it it's a long shot that we'll even do this robbery and it's easy to get busted in the airport he said i don't want to go part of it so then foxy and i continued and then Foxy said, I'm going to ask Gene Gotti if he wants to go with us to do this. So he went back and he told Gene Gotti and Gene met with John 
And uh, as far as I heard, Foxy said, John says, that guy who bots, he's nuts. He's going to get you guys killed in the airport. So Gene Gotti decided not to go. <laughs> Man, we still needed two more guys. And I said, let's ask Funzie if he wants to do this heist, you know. And by that time, we had been watching every week for like three or four weeks. And we asked him. We told him that we were casing. We were clocking all the activity into this building. So he said, okay, but I, I can't go up front. I can't let them see my face. That's okay. We're going to get a truck. We'll hide you inside the truck. Once we get past the gate, we'll go in. We'll make the move. We'll stick up everybody. We'll tape everybody up, put them in an office so they can't see. We'll put ski mask on everybody, and they won't be able to see you. He said, that's okay, but we, we still need another guy. So with that, Foxy went back and talked to John, and Gotti said, listen, I know this guy. He's a little older than me. He's a real tough guy. He's a hitman from, from Harlem. His name is Charlie. You guys should take Charlie. Ask him. So then we met with Charlie and we showed him where we were going to do the score, right inside, you know, JFK cargo area. He was all excited about it because I said, there's got to be a couple of million dollars worth of watches in there. So for two or three more weeks, we watched every Tuesday and we clocked, clocked the employees going in. It was four people. It was uh, two women and two men. And then at 10 o'clock in the morning, U.S. Customs would come there. They'd knock three times on the door, we noticed, and they would open the door, let the two customs inspectors in. I figured that they were going to inspect all the watches that had to be shipped out of JFK to, uh, to New York City. And, and it all looked like we could do this, you know. Our problem was it was a gas shortage in February. So there was a pro and a con. The price of gold had gone up to 120 bucks in three or four months. And now, because in 69, it was $35 an ounce when Cataldo did the heist. Now that we see it's $128 an ounce, I'm figuring, wow, we're going to get a bunch of money for, for the watches if they're gold. By the time we're ready to do the heist, it's up to over 140 an ounce, which is like, Amazing. I mean, it was, uh, you know, something that nobody had ever considered that gold was going to skyrocket. So we kept looking and looking about two weeks before we're going to do the heist. I said, look, we got to get a stolen truck. We got to get paperwork. So Foxy said, look, my cousin can get us some paperwork, like, you know, to show the guard, like a pickup order. So we had everything arranged. We had all black clothes, gloves, ski mask. And then I kept looking. I said, did you notice early as we got there, the two employees met. Then a few minutes later, the other two employees came. I said, look at the size of those locks over there. They were big locks. They were like American locks, like hardened steel silver. And I said, they unload, they unlock the, uh, the, the roll down door and they go in. I said, let's get two locks. And Fox said, what are we going to do with the two locks? Well, after we do the heist, we'll lock them in because about an hour later, Customs shows up and they'll probably be locked in, banging to get out. And Customs going to go, what's going on? They'll have to get somebody to come with a torch to cut the locks. And if we're going to go out to Long Island, because we made arrangements to use a funeral parlor way out in the Hamptons. Jackie Donnelly had a, a brother-in-law that had, had been a mortician and he worked out there and he said, look, you can come out there and use the funeral parlor of the basement for like one or two days. So we're all ready to go. And then Tommy shows up. And I go, you missed the boat. We're doing this, man. He says, you got to be kidding. You guys are going to get killed. Okay. So this is 1974. This is four years before they did the Lufthansa heist, which is very similar, by the way. Go into the airport and stick up a cargo terminal, which is unheard of. Most guys wouldn't even think of doing it. So he was upset that he had missed the boat then? Well, he, he was and he wasn't because he didn't know, you know, what was going, how much was going to be involved or whatever. So finally the day came. We got up early. We got the truck. We got dressed. We put Charlie Scotty and Funzie Terracone in the back of the truck. And then we're wearing these here sort of hats with little ski masks because it's February and it's cold. And we made sure to fill up the truck with gas because it was a gas shortage. And there were lines in New York City that month. So we drive in, we back up, we back up and we knock on the door and somebody opens the door. Foxy and I rush in there. 
and we tie everybody up. We put ski masks over the top of them, turn turn the hats around, lay them down, and tell everybody we're not going to hurt them. And Tara Cohn, who's six foot six, he comes in. He's he's watching all the hostages that we had four of them on the floor in an office. Then we go to the back, and we see this huge room. Had to be like 20, 20 by 30, 20 by 40, I don't know. And we see all these boxes and cases of watches. And from what I heard from Cataldo and, and Donnelly in the past, the ones that were most valuable, they were in big wooden cases because they had all the all the packing for, for the watches to come in, you know, a little plastic box with literature and stuff. Right. So then we started loading them up on these four-wheel hand trucks like you would get at Home Depot and then rolling them out to the truck that's on the dock. We're doing this for 30, 40 minutes. And I said, you know, we got less than an hour. We got to load this whole truck up. Well, after about 30 minutes, everybody was exhausted. So then Foxy went in and said, I'll watch these people for a few minutes. You go out and you load a few, a few loads and get it out in the truck. Well, by the time the hour came, it was like maybe going on maybe nine o'clock and we knew the U S customs was going to come around nine 30, 10. We were fully loaded and we locked the doors on the inside. Then I put those two locks on the outside up on the roll down gate, steel gate figuring, well, customs comes in. I'm not even going to be able to get in. I don't even know it's a robbery. And off we drove out to long Island. So when we got to long Island, we called the number, and the guy met us. We backed up the truck and we slid everything down in the basement. And there was a few coffins down there. I don't know if there was bodies in the coffins, but it was a funeral home. I'm and sure. we lined up everything. And then they, uh, Foxy uh, had, I guess it was Charlie and Funzie drive the car and truck maybe 20 miles away and dump the truck. Well, we never, we always had gloves on. We didn't have to wipe it down. We just left the truck, went back to the funeral parlor. And we spent all day lining up four different shares of all those watches. And uh, I remember I counted them up. I was tabulating how many we had. We had over 14,000 watches each. So it was like 56,000 watches there. And we had spent hours, you know, making a list of what we actually had. Then somebody went and got lunch. And then we were exhausted by six, seven, eight o'clock at night. And we're sitting there. And I don't know who said it. I think maybe Charlie said it. He goes, Ubas, what time is it? And I said, I don't know. I don't have a watch. <laughs> and we were <laughs> laughing, you know. We have 58,000 watches in that funeral home, you know. 58,000. So the next part of this was the next day to get, you know, everybody had to go rent a little small U-Haul, like, van to pick up each, each uh, share of the watches. So everybody showed up. Four of us out there, and um, Foxy and I, we shared the van. The other guys had their own little U-Haul vans. And we drove back, and everybody went off their own way. And then Foxy uh, dropped me off, and I put my stuff in the garage. I had a, a rental garage. And then he took his – I don't know where he went. I don't know where Funzy went with his or what Charlie went with his. But all I know is that Foxy went and gave John Gotti the list. And – it was only one or two days later, we get a call to meet Mike Corio, the attorney. So Foxy and I, we go meet him for coffee. He's, wow. He goes, we hadn't seen him. You guys just pulled off a big score. I go, how do you know that? He said, all I can tell you is that the same insurance company that Cataldo and Donnelly and Tara Cohn dealt with like four years earlier, they got in touch with Queen's robbery squad and said that that company was heisted again. Only this time, four guys went into the upper. We didn't know that Willie Boyd Johnson was an informant that year. And what was happening was, we heard later on, he would get information to the FBI, but they would never make a bust. They would just, because they didn't want to compromise him. So we had time to get rid of all these watches. So Foxy was the first one to bring John samples and a list. And then Charlie, I don't know what he did with his watches, and I don't know what Funzie did with his watches. But we did meet like a week or two later, and Charlie said, hey, I got about 70000 bucks." And then Funzie said, I don't want to say what I got, but I got more than you. 
And then uh, Foxy didn't feel too bad because he only got 60000 from Charlie Fatico and John Gotti. But I'm holding the entire portion of the score, and I got it buried, and I got a list. And so when I make the list, I set aside 600 Rado watches, R-A-D-O, Rado, 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 whatever it was, and uh, half of them were gold and back in the day. And by the time I did look at the gold price, it had already gone over 148. So now it was so much higher than when Cataldo, Donnelly, and, and Cataldo did that at Robbie in 69. I had the list, and I gave it to Cataldo. Well, the bottom line was Cataldo said he wasn't in communication with Gotti and didn't know what Gotti paid Foxy. Foxy told me that he got 60000 which I knew if he got sixty it was worth a hundred thousand, you know, and uh, I had given Dominic like serious collectible watches like Audemars, PJs. These are very high dollar watches. Then there were a couple thousand each. Today they're like twenty five thousand each. Yeah, and I um, so I another month passed, and I'm getting ready. I know I'm going to be going to jail soon. Finally, I said to Catalo, "Look, here's my list." So I give him the list. He's okay. I'm going to bring down a buyer. And so I go to the basement of my, my wife's grandfather's house and I bring the watches there and he looks through them all and he goes off, takes a walk with Cataldo. Cataldo comes back and says, listen, he'll give 90,000. I go, see if he'll give a hundred. He comes back and says, how about 95? I said, okay, you take 10. I'll take the 85,000. So Cataldo says, good. So the next day, the guy comes with the money, give him all the watches, off he goes. But later that day, Cataldo took me for coffee. He says, you didn't tell the truth. You didn't tell me how many watches you got. Said, what are you talking about? He says, about six or 800 watches missing. Because each one of you guys got 600 of those Rado watches. And those guys got like, say, 10 or $15 a watch. I go, well, they're worth much more. And how do you know? that I had 600. He's because Gotti told me. Gotti shared the, the list with him. And they were trying to, you know, kind of control the price of what they were going to pay for these watches. They wanted so to finally, get I agreed. I give the stuff to Cataldo, you know. And then a few months goes by. I go to jail. In the meantime, I now have the watches buried. And where'd you bury them? Wife's grandfather's basement. <laughs> Just like 15 boxes of them. How'd you bury them? Like, what would you put them in? No, oh, I just, I just made a card. I made like a, you know, like a couple of cardboard boxes and stuffed them in there and labeled them with duct tape and stuff. Just left them there. So they're there for like 13 months. I go to jail. I come home. When I come home, the price of gold is not 148 anymore. It's nearing $200 an ounce. <laughs> then I go to check the price. I was able to get five times what I would have got a year and a half earlier. So, of course, Cataldo knew that I was sitting on those. And he asked me, hey, come on, give me some of those radar watches. So I gave him a half a dozen of them. I guess today, each one of those watches goes for over $1,000. So figure it out. If I had 600 of them, they'd be worth 600000 today. Damn. And that's, that's the story of the S&H Palmares watch robbery. Of course, Tommy was always sick and jealous that we got off with it. And, of course, Gotti was surprised that we managed to pull that robbery off without without any difficulty, except for the fact that nobody knew how the FBI found out. And it was 74. So there it was 12 years later, Wooly Boy Johnson was revealed as being a confidential informant. So then we figured out. Of course, I figured out Foxy was already dead. We figured out how they got the information, you know. And uh, who that's, told that's Willie Boy? That was a hell of a score. Who told Willie Boy about it? You think about this highest? Oh, everybody in in the Bergen knew that Foxy made a score, and oh. probably John Gotti. Probably John Gotti was close with Willie Boy. He never figured for a moment. Or maybe Gene Gotti. I don't know. Somebody told Willie Boy. He was there. He knew what was going on, and uh, that's how how the FBI found out about it. But they did nothing. They never arrested anybody. Why do you think so? Because they didn't want to compromise their prize informant. They kept lots of that stuff secret. 
until the time came, you know, and once the guy's work, working on a regular basis, they don't reveal who he is. I mean, I didn't have that happen because, you know, I started working with the FBI in October of seven of uh, October of um, 80, 84. And then the case, the arrest came in 85 of the judge. So I was just out there a few months. I didn't get involved in any other cases. I didn't inform on anybody. I didn't have time for that. I was only interested in the in the judge. That was my deal. Give me the judge. And of course, after I gave him the judge, along came the first Gotti Rico trial. And in the oh, fine man. print of my contract, I had to testify. So I had never even thought that I would testify at the Gotti trial. But so, that's that's the story of the of the watch robbery. You know? <laughs> and the heist that Tommy D. Simone turned down. I mean that right. Right. Uh, that yeah. that is pretty interesting, man. So, I mean, yeah. if people want to go ahead and start asking questions, we're you know we're twenty minutes in. What you thought about this, and if you want to hear more details about this that Sal may have not covered, or that you think he might yeah. be able to expand on a little bit, yeah, just go ahead and ask. I mean, Sal, we can. There's a few uh, good mornings in here. We can go and 50, check that's it. Fifty fifty years ago, and I still remember the detail. Yeah, I know, man. <laughs> but I mean, that, that for something like that, it's like a big deal. You know, it's like something you really can't forget. I mean, that's a, a big score. I mean, really. Yeah. And not to get busted. Because I mean, at the time you could have, uh, if you didn't end up cooperating with the you know government, maybe they wouldn't have brought this case on to you. Do you, do you think, uh, I think just... the statute of limitations ran out, though? Oh, after like seven years or something. So that would have died, you know, in the 80s. You know, and all they really had was his word. They didn't have any other proof anyway. Yeah, there was no evidence. There was no one else to. Uh, Foxy was gone. Sub substantiate that the robbery, you know, was done by us. I mean, everybody else is dead. So. Yeah. So there wasn't really much of a case. <laughs> no. Yeah. OK, well, uh, people, if you want to start asking some questions, uh, feel free to. I know there's a couple here that we can look at. My dad says, good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> good morning, Chris. David Zucker, he David. says, good morning, Sal. Hello, David. That's a movie, David. <laughs> <laughs> Joey Bubbles says, good morning, fellas. Funzie was a scary guy, all the well. <laughs> yeah, Bubbles met him. Yeah, what a trip, man. Uh, yeah. Miss Bubbles says, good morning. Love the stories. <laughs> oh, CC. Hi, CC. Yeah, another good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's see. What's up, guys? Awesome story. I could only imagine having gold watches. <laughs> right? Yes, when gold was pennies, $100 an ounce. Now it's $2,000 an ounce. I can't even fathom what they would be worth today. Oh, so much more. So much yeah. more, man. Yeah. Let's see. You could get one good score a year and live lavishly back then. <laughs> yeah, that's when gas was like, uh, hello, 30 cents a gallon. <laughs> that's insane. And especially <clears throat> with the gas shortage, they had a lot more of a, I mean, what was the, with the shortage, what, how much did it end up going up? Was it, it, went, it, go it was 35, 38 cents, then it went to 70 cents. That was oh. like a big deal. Yeah, it was big. <laughs> now yeah, big it's deal, like then. four bucks, four or five bucks <laughs> yeah. a gallon. <clears throat> Let's see. Paul says, greeting from Hamilton, Ontario, oh, Canada. Yeah. Well, I love the content. Thank you for tuning in, Paul. Yeah. I will say that the, the names of those watches in those days, oh, there was Omega, Piaget, um, Long Jeans, Audema. I mean, there was so many high dollar uh, names of watches because this particular company all they did was transport them uh, from JFK Airport, which all that stuff came from Switzerland, to um, to a place uh, called Torno Corner. It's on, I think, Madison. And it's a very, very famous watch company. So today, these watches, some of those Audemars, if you check them out, could be 20, 30, 40,000 per watch. Per watch, yeah. <laughs> not not just uh, you know a couple of them. I mean, that's just one. That's the ones that you sent me through text message, man. Those were like a couple hundred thousand, and those are what, what were the name of those ones you recall? Audemars. Oh yeah, so yeah, I mean, I I seen some of them for a couple hundred thousands of dollars, yep. man. Yeah, that's insane. Matthew Matthew Tissot, a Constantine. We had all kinds of exotic watches, but I'd say probably five, six, seven thousand of them 
were inexpensive. We only got a couple of bucks for those three or four bucks each. <laughs> but we did get a bunch of money. Yeah. Leon says, thanks for giving us more personal information on Tommy D. Simone from the Goodfellas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are really interested in it, you know, and I, I'd shared that, you know, with our, you know, community of people on our, you know, that follow our podcast. And then we, I think we got like what, 85,000 video or views on the one Tommy D Simone video. And wow. then the other one's like 71,000. That's I mean, a lot of people looking at that. Yeah. So people are, they, they like it, man. Let's see. Universal says, I'm still seeing that those watches still go from 80, 80, 850 to 250,000. You know, 850 to 2,500 each. Oh, 100. So, okay. So it's 2,000 per watch. So that would have been a lot of money. 600 of those. Oh, my gosh. Even <laughs> $150 each. That was 90,000 just for the radar watches. Yeah. We got a super chat here from Tom. Thank you, Tom, for sending in $5. He said, he has a question. He says, How tough was Quack Quack? Would he have been straightened out if he wasn't related to Neil Delacroix? Well, you know, he was known. He introduced Foxy and I to a guy that we did a faux robbery with. That was the one I mentioned with Red Red Collins. And the guy really screwed up, got the wrong car. So he gave the guy a beating and he sent him away. And we never saw him again. He wasn't going to kill him. But he was, he was a rough and tough guy. I think his bark was as big as his bite. I mean, he was pretty tough. I don't know. I guess he would have became a made guy anyway. He was... It might have been a little nepotism there, though, you know, because he was uh, Delacroix's nephew. Yeah, and I, I know you. We did a whole episode on yeah. Angelo Ruggiero. He was one of the hitmen that we covered when we first started. I, I doing personally this. think he was the beginning of the demise of the mob because, with all the conversations that the FBI wiretapped in his house, that gave them PC probable cause to go into. Castellano's house and soon we're going to have Ed McDonald on he's going to talk about what he did as a prosecutor which a lot of people don't know he's going to talk about what he did very straight guy he was the guy in Goodfellas I became friends with him I know him 37 years so uh, he's in private practice today as an attorney but he's writing a book he's going to come on our show I hope to get him on next month yeah, he's a pretty busy man, that's for sure. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, does he still practice law or is he oh, retired? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's pretty busy. Uh, let's see. This one's from uh, Mystery Girl. Her name's, are, it says, was James Burke related to George Burke? I you don't know who George Burke was. I have no clue, Mystery Girl. That's a mystery <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe she might have some more information about it. And then we can see, yeah. it, you know, throw another comment in there. Uh, let's see. Pete says, morning, guys. How many heists did you do with Foxy? Oh, boy. There's a bunch I haven't uh, shared. We did a couple of um, armed diamond robberies. Uh, I would have to tell you that there was more scams and what we called give ups in Manhattan, in the Diamond District. Ever, anybody ever go there? It's 47th and 48th Street between 5th and 6th. And we found greedy people that were in that business and they would give information. So we did we did some pretty risky heist. I, I can't count them all, but for three years it was it was pretty interesting. With those give ups, those are just people that were looking to make a quick buck and then well no, they were like in a position of uh, of information. They would give us the information, they would try to get a little they get we, we would give them what we called a tipster's fee, oh, 10%. Okay. Like if we made 100000 <laughs> we'd give them 10000 But yeah. a lot of times tipsters would give you phony information. Then they'd wind up getting a beating. I mean, these guys really went out on the on the limb giving information. You know, a lot of times Jimmy Burke got tipsters in the airport because those were his gambling customers, his Shylock customers. That's how you develop a source inside JFK. I would imagine, man, he could make a lot of connections with people that, yeah. well, if yeah. they have gambling vices yeah. and they need to pay off their debt, I mean, wow. Yeah, I, and you know, I was thinking we had some mention of how do we know Sinatra Club existed. I'm going to give a name today. If someone could find this guy in Brooklyn and he would tell you all about the Sinatra Club, a very straight guy 
who worked as a truck driver for, uh, in, I think it was International Grocer Association. He was a truck driver and drove around and dropped off like, you know, wholesale groceries in Queens and Long Island. His name was Tommy Block. I Tommy don't know Block. what happened to him. Never thought about him till the other day because I saw somebody posted, well, how do we know the Sinatra Club existed? Well, let me tell you, Tommy Block was a crazed gambler and he loved coming to the Sinatra Club. And I would loan him money, like 100, 200, 300, and he'd pay me interest like it was a Shylock loan. But I'm curious what happened to his life. Maybe somebody out there could find Tommy Block. You know, uh, another guy I just talked with was uh, John Red Collins Jr. You know, he was a Patreon subscriber of us. Yeah. He was, you know, he did a heist with his father. And right. his father, they talked, and he said that his father remembers the Sinatra Club. And I was like, well, damn. Good. We need to hear that because we got so many doubters out there. Oh, how do we know the Sinatra Club existed? Well, I mean, it was just a little couple of little rooms like two stores and oh we, yeah we you know we purdied it up a little bit so guys were comfortable there and uh guys loved it there was nothing like it see because all the other italian mob clubs had doors that were open they left the doors open and they had what they called state charters from the state of new york as being a hunt and fish club or a chess club whatever it was we didn't have any paperwork from new no. york we totally you know, doing a little... like a gorilla, a gorilla move. You know, we just <laughs> had a grand operation. Well, let's see. We got, I mean, look, another question here is uh, from Willie. He says, greetings from Cleveland. You were wiser than other wise guys. Wise enough to know when to get out of the game. Love the stories, Mr. Police. Oh, man. I'm telling you, all I can say is that when I went to jail, I had enough time because I was only in Lewisburg about eight months I started to see and feel the difference. And thank God I met Dave Icavetti, the old time capo. And he told me that it was all changing. Be careful. Uh, it's going to be worse than the Roman, the Roman times when you had all, all the naysayers. And, you know, I mean, it was just, yeah, he, he had a feeling it was going to go belly up the whole mob thing. And he knew that the mob guys, the new guys were paying other mob guys to become made members. They didn't go out and earn their, their reputation. No. It was, it became really, it's sort of like how we've gone, like in college sports. Now kids get a million, two million to go to a college to play football. It's not <laughs> amateurs anymore. So I think in, in essence, the mob went from a professional crime organization to become amateurs. That's all I can say. I could see it coming. How to get out of there. Uh, Universal has another question. They said about once a month, I stuff about Tommy D and Polly Vario, whom would be 119 years old today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> do, you like, do you expand on that, Sal? I guess I didn't well, quite Tommy get Well, Tommy was two years younger than me. My first wife went to school with Tommy. So my first wife was born in 47. I believe Tommy was born in 47, 48. But I don't know. Paulie was. He was look up older. how old Paul Vario. I yeah, he was older. Born in, maybe born in the, he might have been born in 1910. I'm not sure. So maybe he would be <laughs> over 100 years old. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he was an old timer when you met yeah, him. Yeah, he was and an just old timer. Like, yeah. Just like the guys in Lewisburg as well. I right. mean, the exactly. Harry Riccobini and yeah. all them guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's say, okay. So Michael says. Just wanted to say thanks for the content. I've enjoyed listening to you. Keep it up. Okay. <laughs> for, thank you, Michael. You Let's see. Mystery Girl said, thank you, Sal. Mystery. George George was a, a dirty cop. George. I don't know. George Burke. Oh, he might I have wrote a book. George Burke was a dirty. Well, we had a lot of dirty cops back in the 70s. I mean, I had a guy, if I would give him a plate number, he'd bring me back the information like, the next morning <laughs> on where that car resided or if I gave them a name of somebody, you know, they can go into the computer in those days. It wasn't much of a computer like today, you know, and they could get information and they would just show, I think they would flash their badge number. So some of those guys had phony badges. There was no cameras. So they got away with all kinds of things in those days. Yeah. So many of them, man. 
Uh, let's see. Pete said, like Sal said, wise guys weren't that wise to pick up on the FBI and was doing surveillance surveillance wise. Yeah. 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 They were doing well, all kinds of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, the FBI had limitations, but people don't know what it what it really took to get authorization to wiretap people. You had to get PC probable cause. And that took a while to get. Well, once they started to record, you know, the whole Gambino crew and Angelo just opened up this can of worms. I mean, he ran around saying, oh, I moved to a new house. They could never wiretap my house. The house was wiretapped for sound and <laughs> film and everything. I mean, he had no clue. He must have been shocked when the, when those recordings, you know, came available to the attorneys listening to all that stuff. And in those recordings... He not only talked about the life of crime, he talked down about John Gotti. So Gotti <laughs> lost respect for him. Oh, it was man, just sure. a, a time to end, man. People just didn't get it. Lee says, good morning, guys. Thanks for tuning in, Lee. Yeah. He always, uh, he, like I always say, man, he always watches all the shows, man. Every episode I come out with on yeah, cool. either our podcast or on yeah. mine separately, man. Yeah. He's a big supporter, man. He said, uh, why would people... Say it doesn't exist. Crazy. The Sinatra Club he's probably talking about. Who knows? You know, we got a lot of naysayers on there. A lot of people. We got 45, 50-year-old guy telling me what happened in 1974. He wasn't even born. <laughs> <laughs> so I left. <laughs> uh, let's see. Rosario, I believe, says, good morning. It, it was great hearing the story. Yeah, we got some other stories. I may be able to do a couple of stories about gas pipe. I knew one of the guys that hung out with gas pipe. I've not shared this with anybody, but Who they were slick. They were circumventing alarm companies in Brooklyn, Queens. And I'm not sure if it was ADT or Holmes, if people knew these names, but they were able to go into banks and spend all night or a weekend burning through the cells and get all that stuff out of the safe deposit box. Nobody knows how much money they were getting, but I do know a couple of guys who were involved, so they had quite an operation. Well, I read the that book because I remember you wanted to do something about ga gas pipe, um, you know, a month or so ago. And holy crap, man, I got like almost a hundred things. You know, hundred. Uh, I made a list and out of the book, I got like a hundred things of notes up about him. I mean, oh this yeah, guy that was a involved. crazy guy. Even yeah. Sammy Gravano called him. Uh, a wacko, a sicko, you know. <laughs> Jeez, he was pretty, man. Uh, pretty violent guy. And at the end, you know, he flipped, but it didn't do him any good. Yeah, he no. reduced his sentence. He lied. He lied so much. When you go over to the government, they debrief you, and you've got to tell them everything that you did. And when I went over, I told them about 99%. <laughs> <laughs> Almost I left a few things out. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I went into the program, I tell people this. They brought us to different locations. First, they hit us out in Buffalo. Then they hit us out in uh, Washington, D.C. And when they finally enter you in the program, you have to go through this, this list and you have to go see a, a therapist, a psychiatrist and all. And then they asked me, do you have any assets, any money? I said, I got about 40 bucks. <laughs> but I had a little satchel and my son carried it around. And there was a bunch of valuables in there. So I didn't have it. He did. <laughs> That's how you. Of course, you're. Oh, did you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. I said we got a uh, super chat here for $50. Oh, wonderful. Let's hear it. Um, let's hear it, man. Wow. Uh, Francisco, I believe it's how you say it. Uh, and he Anthony said. Anthony Stabile and Angelo Seppi. Did you know them? From what I read, well, uh, I knew Anthony Stabile because I also knew his brother, Fat Tommy Stabile, and they were characters. Um, I didn't do any crime with them, but uh, Fat Tommy only lived a few blocks away from me, and he was uh, a known hijacker. I knew his whole family, his daughters, his wife, and uh, I didn't know Angelo, but yeah, they they were pretty close, and uh, I guess they were coke buddies with with Tommy. Tommy. Um, he got really bad at the end of 73, 74, because I had met him in 71, and I just think he got caught up in, as a coke addict. 
do you know much more about these guys? What family they were with? I didn't know. I didn't know a lot about those guys because I was always kept away from guys with other crews because I wasn't going to share any information with them. But I knew, I knew Fat Tommy well, and then that's his brother Anthony. I think Anthony got whacked. I'm not sure. You know, um, really, uh, in those days, we would hear somebody got killed, and two days later, it would be a forgotten story. I mean, people getting killed all the time. You know, it's just the way it was. And when they did the Lufthansa heist, I had a deli. And all the guys would come over there for a sandwich. Because when I made a sandwich with Boar's Head cold cups, it was big and stuffed. And one of the guys that was on that heist used to come over for Italian salami sandwich. I think his name was Paulio. Paul, Paulio. I think he was found dead. But he did. Oh, see, both guys got whacked in the 80s. Yeah, yeah that's what it was. Yeah, so we had a lot of guys came in the deli. It was called Parkside Deli. And then we had a bar four or five houses away called the Parkside Bar and Grill. So, yeah, we were busy there. And all the guys from the Bergen would come over and get a sandwich. And uh, what was his name? Uh, Tony Roach. He loved to come there to get, oh, yeah. get a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> he was a good athlete, though, Tony Roach. Yeah, really tall and everything yeah. like that, man. Yeah. Well, Francisco, uh, thank you. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. I'm good at butchering names and yeah. stuff. But no, that, we appreciate that. That was really nice yeah. of you, sending that $50. That's cool, man. Yeah. Like I said, I did meet those guys, but I didn't hang out with them. I mean, I knew Anthony. Uh, I just didn't hang out with those guys. Occasionally, I did have a drink with Fat Tommy, though. Fat Tommy Sabila. I think he went to Florida and died. But he had about two or three beautiful daughters and a nice wife. So we knew the family. We knew the family. They would come into the deli. So, I mean, what was uh, when you drank with him? How was he like? Was He, he just... just hung out. You know, uh, he, he liked sports. You know, we always had something to talk about. And he was known as a, as a uh, truck driver. So he would travel around a lot of sports. Well, he would drive a stolen <laughs> truck for guys because he was really big. He was large, yeah. I mean. <laughs> that's where he got his name i suppose that time yeah <laughs> uh let's see let's go back up here it says uh, from andrew he said does ed practice criminal defense practice like the tax cases and stuff like that ed mcdonald uh he still is a criminal prosecutor uh, not a prosecutor criminal attorney he was a prosecutor for years in brooklyn but now he works for a big firm and i talk to him occasionally we're going to try to get him on <clears throat> so he'll talk about what what took place uh, during the Gambino uh, Castellano years? Pete says, "Did you know Joe Dogs?" Oh, Joe Dogs! I met Joe Dogs through Dominic Cataldo, and it's a funny thing. While we were doing the Sinatra Club movie, Joe Dogs had a book that had come out, and he also had a cookbook. And one day, Mark Belesco, who played Foxy, called Joe Dogs. And we talked on the phone, but he was very nervous. Very really? nervous, you know. And then I think he died. He he got beat up by this guy, uh, Tommy Agro. Agro oh. really beat him up and I think left him for dead once or something. But Joe Dogs was the character. What uh was he with what family was he with? Well, he was with the Gambinos, I believe. I mean, I know Cataldo uh, used him to get guns or something. I think he was involved in you know, getting weapons. I don't know what else he did. I just wasn't that close with him. But I had met him several times. Yeah, that's what it was looking like. I was looking him up. Because, yeah, he, he did write a book and stuff. But, yeah, you're right. He's gone now. But He's gone. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Marco says greetings from Siberia. Si Serbia. Serbia. <laughs> Whoa, that's way out there. <laughs> I didn't know we were touching guys in Serbia. Serbia, yeah. That's pretty cool, man, everywhere. Yeah. I mean, just a little bit, you know, mainly yeah. here in America. But there is, you know, lots of people from UK and then all these other countries and stuff. And it's really, <laughs> really awesome, man, that they can, yeah. you know, tune in and, you know, different languages and stuff, barriers and stuff. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool, man, that they still yeah. watch. I, I didn't want to sound braggart about that heist, but it was, it was pretty intense. Yeah. No, I mean... Uh, let's see. John says, Sal, why did you leave L.A.? Well, you know, I think my time I had finished there. I had worked under different names in the uh, film business. 
uh, had met up with a woman, had two kids. And when I split with her in 11, it was time to go. I mean, if I had been younger, I had plenty of producers I met. I probably would have been either A, a character actor or (laughs) producing (laughs) movies. But I think we're going to do something soon that could be exciting. And then we'll announce it on this podcast. So we're going to do a... we're going to do some reviews on movies. Yeah. Uh, Dave Zucker said Dangerfield was a gambler, and I think he was he was at the club to play cards. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I knew Dangerfield was a gambler, but I don't remember if he came. We had, we had some people that came there, became well-known. One was the guy called Lenny Montana, who played Luca Brasi in the, in the uh, Godfather movie. So he would come there. And then we had a guy named Big George. This guy was a huge guy, about six foot nine. He was hanging out with the Gambinos. He would come there, and he was in a movie called Gloria. I became friends with him. And then all of a sudden, in 1979-80, uh, years after I had closed the Sinatra Club down, I had a jewelry store, and he came to visit me. And he was in a little trouble. Then he disappeared. And then they found him whacked out at a studio in Los Angeles. Somebody killed him down there. So I don't know what he was doing, ripping off wise guys. He was doing something illegal. But Big George, yeah. Damn. Um, let's see. He said, wasn't yesterday the anniversary of Paul Castellano's hit? I think you, it was the 16th. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Really close to Christmas time. I remember yeah. always hearing in the My documentary. Goodness, that's uh, 32 years ago. Amazing. No, I'm sorry, 23 and uh, what was that 15? Oh, 38 years ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah. in 85, it says he yeah, died on December 16th. Ago. Yeah, yep. right, right when you left. <laughs> yeah, I left that year. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Sally US or us says, do you know anything about Paul Grubb? Don't know. Tell us. Tell us about Paul. Who was Paul? <laughs> What, was it, what family was he with? I mean, any more information, just let us comment and we'll, we'll see if we can expand on it. Maybe he went by another name, too. Uh, oh, boy. You know, this was ABCD says, Sal, tell us the story about you almost getting killed trying to try tied was, to a pool. I got tied. Yeah, that's a whole that's a whole episode. One of these days we'll tell that story. And that's how vicious and treacherous the mob got guys got. They were greedy. Uh, somebody ripped off a made guy's house of a million bucks. And I was flashing a bunch of money around that year. And they thought I did it. They thought Foxy did it. So they got a hold of us and kept us in the basement. I will tell that whole story, but we'll do save that for another day. You know, I never even heard that one, man. So <laughs> I guess good questions here, man, because I, yeah. I never heard that one. I'm How did ABCD a- find out about that story? You must have told it somewhere. Maybe it was in the book. I never, I don't think I read it in the I book. You got to realize I did two books over 35 years, and sometimes the stories are all the same. I didn't embellish them, but I get almost, I almost forget who I told the story to. I might have told that story <laughs> on stage. I'm not sure, but all my stuff is 99 and 44, 100. It's true. I don't embellish, I don't exaggerate. I uh, tell them the story about the watch robbery. I didn't want to seem excited, but it was sort of an interesting thing. It was sort of like Robert Wagner takes a thief, you know, television stuff. It's kind of fun when you look back. I would never think of doing a thing like that today. <laughs> no, good <laughs> luck. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tom asked, did Francis go to the Sinatra Club? No, I met, uh, I met Michael right after he got made at Dominic Cataldo's restaurant, it must've been 78 or around that time and didn't see him anymore. I knew who his father was because his father and my uncle were on trial in the sixties for bank robbery. But I never met Michael again until, Oh, about 10 years ago, we both were part of national geographic, the making of the American mob. I think, I think I gave you that DVD and, um, that company toured us around. We made appearances in New York and Philadelphia and talked about the life. And my my words to Michael was, Michael, because he's a little bit younger than me, you grew up like in royalty. Your dad was so famous, you know, 
I, I didn't pay attention to what Michael did. And there's all kinds of things about up online who did what and where. You know, we left that life. That's not what we do. So I don't look down on anybody. Whatever they did, they did because they had to do it in those days. But I met Michael again, like I said, about 10 years ago. And I haven't talked to him since. But I knew a little bit about him and his family. He had a son that was a baseball player. I think he was in the Mets organization, which I thought was cool because I had sons that were athletes also. But I always liked him. I thought he was well-spoken. Gentleman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's. This one's uh, Universal asked. He said, hey, Sal, did you ever work with uh, Lefty Ruggiero or Sonny Black from the Bananas? I mean, you met Sonny Black, right? But I think I briefly met Sonny Black. I, I didn't associate with Lefty. I mean, I was really introduced to to uh, Joe Messina long before he was a made guy and long before he became the boss. But uh, no, and I left. I sort of left the life in 81, 82, and then went back in 84 and got busted. Uh, by that time, everything had changed because a lot of people asked me, well, how come you didn't know Sammy? I left New York City in 81, 82, moved upstate New York. I don't even know what year Sammy got close to Gotti because originally Sammy was a Colombo guy, I think. And then he moved over to Gotti. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't know Sammy. A lot of these guys I didn't know at all. And I wouldn't say I did know him because, you know, I don't lie about stuff like that. Pete said, Sal, what kind of mustard do you use on your heroes at your deli? I like gray coupon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, man. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Joe Mazza says, hello, Sal. was wondering if you knew Joey Shoeshine. <laughs> no. Who, who was Joey Shoeshine? Who was yeah, that? Yeah, that'd be interesting to hear, you know, what family he was with. Or Yeah. Let's see. It's, it says, so did you know Joey? Sh oh, he's calling him Joey Shoeshine, Merlino's father oh, in South in Philly. South I mean, Philly, no. No, no the mean, only guys I met was a guy named uh, Guatuccio in Lewisburg. I met him, big guy. His brother was in jail, I think, also at the same time. And then, of course, I met uh, Rick Abini and, and – uh, and uh, Chick and Phil. I met those guys in prison. Sort of got friends with them because I watched them play chess every day. But otherwise, I really didn't associate with the guys in Philly. No. Never thinking that was going to become a bloodbath over there. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, the, uh, he's basically asking if you knew the Merlinos, I suppose. I don't know if that was Joey's actual nickname, Shoeshine, or if that, you know, I, I don't think he'd like that name. You know I what I mean? Know those. Didn't Just know like. Those guys. Tommy didn't like that nickname, yeah. so you know I don't think Joey would either. So I don't know. Whatever. Uh, let's see. How's it going, fellas? Love the stories from the about the Philly guys. Sal did time with South Philly in the house. He says. <laughs> yeah, I was absolutely fascinated that that whole Philadelphia city, you know, became so mobbed up. But you got to remember, I was in jail '74. Then when Atlantic City opened up there was so much money to be made. And then you could understand the jealousy and the treachery. And, you know, it was interesting. And I, I, I thought that that Sal Testa, Salvi, well, I only met him in a visiting room. Nice guy. He was only 18 years old when I met him. I thought he would have been some kind of force in uh, Philadelphia. But that Scarfo guy was a psycho. He really was a psycho, Scarfo. Yeah, and he ended up taking him out after yeah. a while. Let's see. Ethan, my friend, he said, my man, he said, how's it going, fellas? Thanks for tuning in, Ethan. Good. How are you, Ethan? How are you doing? <laughs> Let's see. This one, yeah, of course you did. Let's, uh, Sal, did you ever meet any corrupt, corrupt cops? <laughs> Back in the day? Every oh, yeah. other day. <laughs> <laughs> of course. They all of course. had their hands out. They, <laughs> they had their hands out for money. You know, it was easy in those days, really. Uh, there was a time when it wasn't an insult to ask a cop, you know, hey, can I give you something? Today, I don't I don't know how it works, but, yeah, we had a lot of guys on the take. On the take, we called it, yeah. <laughs> cool. I'll let you read this one because I don't want to butcher the name from Willie. Oh, Cusimano. Mm -hmm. He lived in – oh, that was a Angelo Cusimano. I didn't know him. And he lived he in Brooklyn and he liked to gamble. I didn't know him. <laughs> Uh, let's see. 
Francisco asked, what was Joe Messino like? Wasn't he a hijacker as well during the 70s? Yeah, he was making his way up because he had this uh, J&J, you know, J&J uh, deli, and then he had a restaurant. But I met him with Cataldo back in the early 70s, and Foxy and I actually had to give a guy a beating for him. So he was friends with Gotti in the early 70s. Those guys weren't even made then. Then later on, oh, yeah, later on in the late 70s, uh, he asked me to give one of his guys, Goldie, you know, some work. Like he was a good car thief, and I gave Goldie some work. I never knew Goldie's name. And then finally, I don't know, not long ago, I read about him in the New York Post. He was kind of a Polish guy. and he, he German, I think it was. Yeah, German, Polish. He wound up testifying against uh, Joe Messina. But Messina bit the dust, and guess what? Ed McDonald secretly defended him. So we'll get McDonald to tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Parrish says, just wanted to say thank you to Sal for his time every week and telling these great stories. Love to get a movie of your of you or your TV show of your life in Goodfellas vein. Well, that would be, we got some stuff going on. David Zucker uh, is going to be producing some stuff with me. David's been around a long time. He did a movie like, uh, let's see, Airplane. He did uh, all kinds of movies over the last 40 years. So we're going to be meeting in a few weeks, and we're going to create some content. Hopefully, uh, you guys will enjoy a show that we're working on. Yeah, it would be really, really cool to see it, you know, yeah. get put on the big screen or some some kind of, you know, streaming platform or whatever. Right, right. Now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Lee says, Sal is a sharp dude. We can see why he what he why he made it <laughs> made it out well of i tried to stay above water here <laughs> you know i'm telling <laughs> you people you know people think once you were a criminal and i told adrian today that you're gonna be a criminal forever when no. i left new york city and went to texas with a new name yes i stuck out like a sore thumb there i never once committed crime i found all kinds of ways to make money soon i'm gonna start sharing some of the ideas that I came up with to make money. And I made some serious money in LA. Uh, I did all kinds of things. Oh, so yeah. um, you don't have to be a criminal to make money. You just got to be creative and you got to be tenacious. And that's what I tell young people. I've actually taught some people how to make money. So we'll, <laughs> we'll kick that around next year with Adrian. Some of the things I did, you'll be surprised how much money you can make straight and i'll tell you a story about as i was in invited to speak uh, in la at a special uh, in front of a special group that were learning how to, to be film editors and these people were like run-of-the-mill working people who was a fireman who was a <laughs> truck driver and they all wanted to get into the film business so i was invited to speak there and i got to remind adrian to, to uh, remind me to tell the story about when I went up in front of this group, about 50 or 100 people, and I took something, opened my hand up, and I said, I want you to look at this, and I'll tell you what it is next month and how much money I made with a little tiny idea. Oh, man. I, I, I think I remember where that's going. I, I, I recall that story. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, too, you know, with out telling these stories, you know, I mean, yeah, he, he likes telling them and stuff, but he wants to have some kind of purpose or some kind of, you know, message with these, you know what I mean? And that's something, you know, we're, we're taking into consideration, you know, because we yeah. want to make sure Sal feels good about what he's putting out there, you know, because yeah, he, he lived that criminal life for, you know, a number of years and stuff. And that's not what he's all about, you know? So no, no 39 know. years in crime. <laughs> and now it's going on 39 years out. <laughs> yeah. So we might take a poll, you know, in this next week coming up and, you know, what, what kind of poll did you have in mind, Sal, to run, you know, to ask people? Know, maybe what, some ideas from, from our listening audience. Some of the things that we could do that could benefit people. Because, look, uh, you know, I have a son that's a little bit dysfunctional. He's 27. And Adrian has a, a brother that's struggling because, you know, they get involved with things they shouldn't be using. You know, whatever it is, drugs or whatever. And uh, I would like to use some of my experiences to want people to stay away from the, thing, the things that they think are cool. You know, uh, internet scams are not cool. You know, it's not. So if you're creative enough to 
get involved in a scam, think about how you could do it legally and make some money. I mean, mm -hmm. you call it a side hustle now. I, I didn't remember <laughs> hearing that 40 years ago. A hustle was a hustle, you know. Yeah. There's lots of ways to make money for you guys that are 30, 40, 50, whatever. And, and no, I agree. Like that's, uh, you know, with my show, I want to cover good, great redemption stories. You know, this next year, yeah. I got a lot, lot of interviews and stuff yeah. already lined up, ready to come out. But I just I feel yeah. the same way. I want to have some kind yeah. of purpose, some kind of message between each yeah. each interview that I do and what how it can benefit people and motivate and inspire. Yeah. And I mean, we can figure out ways to incorporate your past into what can be benef beneficial yeah. to people. There, there, there's ways we could do that. So, yeah. I mean, I got to give a disclaimer. I told that story about that white, that watch. I just, that's 50 years ago. And I would severely warn you not to think about doing something like that today. <laughs> no way. Yeah, I know. And I think that's something that we can incorporate. You know, you can tell a story and you can at, at the end of the interview or some, somewhere in between, you can say, hey, this is why you shouldn't. But, you know, look, 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 look how much effort and time you yeah. put into Absolutely. You know, just clocking this heist. I mean, yeah. imagine, like you said, if you would have did it legitimately. And yeah, I, I like to uh, disseminate information. You know, listening audience, you should know three women a day are murdered in this country. Three women every day. To me, that sounds amazing. And that's just one little tiny type of crime. So no. guys think they can get away with murder. Well, sooner or later, sometimes it takes years with the technology they have today, DNA, now it's AI, I would suggest you walk away from any ideas of crime because you're going to get caught. <laughs> That's true, man. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, Sal. You know what I mean? We just want to make sure we both feel good about what we're putting out. and Yeah, you know, good information. Sure. Maybe we'll do some funny crimes where guys do get caught. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. There's probably a lot of them stories, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got another ten dollar uh, super chat cool. here, from Jacqueline. Jacqueline, how are you, Jacqueline? Thank you for how tuning you doing? in. My yeah. wife wants to know who's Jacqueline. <laughs> One of our favorite women that give us a little, a couple of pennies. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's always donating. She says, "Sal, the Sinatra Club had me screaming. Your wife put a beat down on the chick. The nerve of her to come in the in her house. I really enjoyed reading it. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, you read." <laughs> Oh, she's talking about the one-time girlfriend I have. She drove the car through the front door. <laughs> yeah, those days was pretty crazy. But I'm glad you're enjoying the book. You know, at the end of the book, you'll feel that, you know, some people don't believe what I did, but I did what I did. It was 99% true. I had to start over. And I always said, I'm going to start over fresh. So when I started over and went to L.A., it was a challenge, I'm telling you. But I did find ways to make make money straight. I was selling what they called three eight. First, they were two eighty sixes, two eighty sixes, three eighty sixes, four eighty six Pentiums. I was selling computers every day. I'd go over the hill to La Cienega, buy two or three computers, bring them back to the valley, and I make a couple of hundred dollars. I couldn't believe it. I could make two three hundred dollars just driving over the hill in L.A. So I found ways to make money, and it wasn't crime. And I laughed all the way back and forth. You know, I did a lot of interesting things. Some one of these days we'll talk about it. Oh yeah, I know. but yes, I did have some moments where I didn't treat my first wife the way I should have, and I've since apologized to her every couple of years. I talk to her, say hello, and she goes, "Okay, you finally changed your ways. <laughs> <laughs> You're a changed man." Yeah, <laughs> it just it took, only a while. took a long time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But I mean, a change is possible, man. No matter how long it takes. Yeah. As long as you try, as long as you change, man. Uh, let's see. Where were we at with questions? From Michael, he said, "Did Tommy D. Simone know, know Roy DeMeo?" I I really don't know because I didn't get to meet DeMeo until the mid seventies. Uh, from what I read. DeMeo was a psycho. He was a sicko. Uh, he, he even killed an innocent guy. I mean, the guy lived a total dysfunctional life. I think he really had guilt at the end because from what I read, and I think his son wrote the book, uh, he took his watch off, his ring off, and he went somewhere and he knew he was going to be killed. So, I mean, he got caught up in all that murder with the two, two guys, the Gemini twins. 
I mean, it was terrible. But that guy, people don't understand. That guy made money in every possible illegal way you can imagine. I didn't know he was doing drugs. I didn't know he was doing murders. I sold him cars, car parts. And just like some of the people questioned all the things that I did, people don't have a clue on how many illegal things I could do in the course of the day. Really. A lot. Gambling. <laughs> buying stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Buying stolen merchandise. Uh, uh, dealing drugs. I mean, you name it. I could do half a dozen crimes in one day and meet a half a dozen men and they wouldn't know each other. So yes, it was a very different life. And I think, I think the Mayo was a psycho. And I always say, you get what your hand calls for. He did all those murders and they found him murdered in the car. Tommy, we don't know exactly what happened, but he did a lot of treacherous things. So I don't have any feeling about, you know, what happened to him at the end, but if you look at all the people I knew, how many of them would died miserable with cancer? So I don't have any cancer. I don't think I'm going to get any cancer. And I'm going to go to sleep one day, maybe 10, 15 years from now. I still got to give my wife about 12 more years. <laughs> <laughs> and that will put me at 9-0. Oh, and then uh, you'll clock out. <laughs> yeah, you know, we got a lot to do. We got things to do, my wife. Yeah. And uh, I think I know the answer to these two questions that are coming up. Uh, you didn't know any Chicago guys. You didn't uh, know the corrupt cops. Oh, those Lewis two guys. And Steven. Who, who would want to know Cara Kappa and Eppolito? Oh, my God. They actually thought they were going to be in the movie business and move to Vegas until the government found them. Yeah, terrible, that didn't work out. Terrible more life count. they lived, man. <laughs> terrible life. Uh, this one says, oh, I didn't get the notification. Good morning, guys. You know, we... we there's people that get notifications, so when we go live on their phone, they'll get, oh, okay, Sal's cool. live, but <laughs> thanks yeah. for two. At least you made it. At least you, we're still live. Yeah. We're still going here. <laughs> I didn't, uh, I don't know if we made it public, but I got to talk to Foxy's niece oh, yeah. and nephew recently, and they're like in their 40s, and no one ever gave them information about their uncle. So we had a great call earlier in the week, about an hour on the phone with them, and I was glad to hear that uh, Foxy's brother, Paul was a police officer forever, and his son turned out to be a police officer, and his sister is a dental hygienist, and it was good talking to them because I told them all about Foxy's personality, who he was, and how much my family admired uh, Foxy. You would not know when he would come to a family outing a barbecue, he would not know that he was the guy who liked doing a heist. You'd think <laughs> he was a businessman. He would dress nice. Always had a smile on his face. And I was completely devastated when my wife came to uh, to the prison. By the way, tomorrow, it's, oh my God, it's already 49 years tomorrow that he died on December 18th. That's tomorrow, huh? Yeah. Damn, such a long time ago. I mean, yeah, I, did. I mean, a lot of these events and everything come back up, man, every yeah. year. So I'm sure you get reminded of yeah. it. Yeah. Your one true friend in that whole. I mean, was he really the only true friend you think you well, had? Well, the only uh, friend you could trust. In that life, totally yeah. could trust him in any possible way, yeah. I think I know you didn't know these guys, either the Boston Whitey Bulger or Flemmy. No, <laughs> this was quite a group right there. That's quite an entry, man. Uh, you know, for years they, they worked both sides with the government, and they were involved. They were in and involved in the mob and all. And it was kind of amazing. I was in L.A. when they found Whitey Bulger out there in Santa Monica. Well, it was amazing what, what they found. A lot of money and guns. and Yeah, he was he was a pretty sick guy. Killed, killed two or three women, too. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Scarfo was jealous of Sal Testa because he sold Donald Trump a bar from the shore. Uh, for $3 million, and there was a huge write-up about it. And the upcoming star of the Philly mob. Well, interesting. I, I didn't know if uh, Testa sold that. That that I didn't know. I know Trump bought a place from some mob guys. Uh, I thought it was Lee and Eddie. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, everything happened there quickly in Atlantic City. This one is from Paris. She said, what was the mood? 
of the mob when Henry flipped? Was everyone running scared when it happened or did they just, you know, move with business, business as usual? Uh, I clearly remember my attorney who was Corio's, my Corio, he was Gotti's attorney, Henry's attorney coming to my jewelry store and telling me that Henry had flipped and that, uh, he had predicted heads were going to roll. I mean, he, he knew what Henry was capable of. Uh, and of course, you know, McDonald was the one that debriefed Henry. And when Henry gave him information about what, you know, what was going on, uh, you know, to do it, all the drugs and, and the mob and, and uh, Loftons, he accidentally mentioned that Henry had mentioned that he was involved in fixing a basketball game at at Bo at Boston College, BC, yeah. mm -hmm. and and McDonald was a BC alumni. He was so mad, so that became a big case. Also, the BC he took scandal. it personal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. This one is, he said, well, I'm not sure if it's what it is, but it is, their name's Top Fee Coco. <laughs> he said, Sal, how did you feel, or how did you go about meeting regular people when you went straight? Did you ever feel like you didn't have anything in common with legitimate people? No, I will tell you that I got to Texas. It's in the synoptical book. Well, actually, it's in the new book coming. And I developed friendships through, uh, you know, how you meet you got kids in school, then you meet other families. And I met coaches, and I was deeply involved in football there uh, in the 80s. And I didn't feel I didn't have anything in common with them. Uh, I would identify something we did have in common, which was, you know, our kids were on the football team. And I stayed away. Uh, I stayed away from anybody I thought that was involved that looked kind of questionable about crime. I never once talked to a criminal in Texas, never saw a gun. Never did anything illegal. I mean, I just didn't do it. Oh, yeah, I had a bunch of assets with me, a lot of jewelry and some gold and stuff. So I was able to, you know, hang around for a couple of years. But that ended, and I had to go find a way to make money. And the first thing I did in Texas after I met a couple of coaches was I got involved in silk screening clothing. And I learned how to do that and made a little bit of money. I, you know, wasn't going to get rich, but I made some money. Yeah, my dad says go get your shoe, uh, your shine, shine box. box. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but a lot of people think that's funny. <laughs> Universal says, "What was your main regret, regret Sal?" <laughs> well, it's I don't think it's the crime. It, I think it was when I really think back, <clears throat> maybe the amount of time I didn't give my family, my first family, but those kids got through high school, college, yeah, and you know. One one day, about 15 years ago, my two sons invited me to a meeting. I went to San Francisco and sat down in the conference room, and they just unloaded on me. They said, Dad, this is how disappointed we are with the things that you did back in the day. I couldn't do anything about it. I listened to them for an hour, two, two hours, and I apologized, and that was it. And we moved on with our lives. So I did have – I mean, I was so focused on self. I would say I was a little bit of a narcissist, yes. And I uh, wasn't paying attention to other people. That's not where I am today. So it took a long time, a lot of years, to make changes. Well, at least you made them, man. It just took a little yeah. while, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you didn't, you know, who knows if you'd even be here telling these stories at all, man. That's right. Uh, let's see. We got a lot of questions today. Yeah, I know. I like it. I, I figured we get you know a lot of good traction on here. But uh, let's see. You want to read that? I, I don't want to pronounce Henry the Hill name. Henry said on an interview that Jimmy Burke killed 80 people. First, I find it incredible, and I don't believe it. But <laughs> then it's just that Henry knew about crazy stuff. God only knows. I just didn't see Jimmy Burke as a vicious, treacherous man that killed 80 people. Now... I think he changed a lot because he was hanging out in a bar three blocks from my house after they did that Lufthansa robbery. And yeah, guys were turning up dead. So I don't know. I mean, I, I knew him in the early seventies, uh, in 78, 79, what he was doing. I have no idea. I backed away from all those guys about that time. Actually, yeah. after I got out of prison, 75, I backed away from 
the Bergen guys and Jimmy Burke and Paulie. Pete says Sundays, 11 a.m. like clock work. He's talking about our show because Eastern yeah. time we go at 11, right. Central time, 10 a.m., and then right. West Coast, uh, yeah. 8 a.m. So <laughs> Yeah, we got a lot of questions. I know. I mean, let us let me see if I can get to some people that we haven't got to. I do want to get to this one, though. It says, uh, has Sal ever heard of Frank DiMatteo from Red Hook? Didn't know Frank DiMatteo from Red Hook. No, I didn't. Well, I've interviewed him probably like oh, okay. five, five or six times. I mean, he's he's really cool, man. He's okay. he uh, he was with the Gallo crew for a little bit when he was younger. You know, he was like an associate, and then he went to Genovese after the Gallo crew dismembered, and then went to the De Cavalcante family. Ended up leaving the life. Never cooperated, but he's got he writes a lot of good books and stuff, and he's wow. cool, man. I, he said he he would. I I had talked to him months ago when we first started this, and he said that he would be interested in doing a show with me, you and him, and just talk about stuff. Because how old is he? Oh, he's got to be maybe in his six late sixties, seventies, maybe. Okay. I, so he he's kind of. I mean, you're older than him, but yeah. He, he, there is from his stories that I've read, you know, his books. I mean, there's guys that you guys know in common and stuff, but yeah, maybe a possible show in the future. Yeah, he's maybe really, he's always been cool with me, man. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, uh, Fran Francesco says, uh, was because this is going to have to do with uh, you know, this possible thing that you the, the new project right. that you might be involved with. <clears throat> this is the question was Joe Pesci's Tommy. An accurate portrayal of the real-life Tommy personality-wise. A video comparing the Goodfellas characters to their real-life counterparts would be interesting. Well, it's interesting, Francisco, that you have asked this question. Because I'm about to sit down next month and dissect the entire movie and characters. Because I knew those guys personal. And I think it's interesting. I think... Um, you got to remember Scorsese created that character for the film. Although the real Tommy was radical and vicious and uh, <clears throat> he didn't look at all. Pesci did not look at all like Tommy. Uh, I think Henry was around to give some information about some of the language that was used and some of the humor because there's a lot of dark humor in that movie. But I think he did a great job, and the public just, you know, got became fascinated with the, the work that Pesci did. So yeah. we'll see what happens. And uh, I like the idea of accurately depicting what I thought of the movie and then what I thought of the characters. I think that's that's interesting for me because I spent 20 years in Hollywood. He also had a follow-up. He said, was Jimmy Burke a cokehead? Not that I knew. I don't think I, I Jimmy liked to drink. He was a yeah. scotch drinker. I don't think Jimmy, I don't think of Jimmy as using cocaine. Not at all. I never seen, read anything about that no. either, but I guess you knew him personally. So uh, let's see. This was another one they had. So, I mean, this is going to be something that you'll cover next month too, is what was Henry Hill's personality like in real life? Well, you know, Henry was uh, a drug user, always a drug user. Um, I knew him before he and I went to jail, and then we met in Lewisburg. After I left Lewisburg, I did not see him. Well, that was 75. By the time Henry went into the program, I never saw him again. Sometime around, oh, I want to say, 90, oh, 92, 93, like that, I, I said before, a CBS producer by the name of Jamie Stoltz called me. Jamie said, Sal, you got a friend who wants to talk to you. What friend? He's Henry Hill. He gave me his number. I called him. And it was it was 1992, the summer. And Henry was living out on a desert <clears throat> near Palmdale. And I went out there for a Sunday dinner. We went and we talked. And then he came back to, uh, to L.A. and said he had a contact with a couple of producers. And if we could write a page about Gotti, we probably could get paid for a treatment for a movie. And that's what we did. But so then Henry came to Studio City while I was managing apartment complex. And I opened the closet door and he saw all the keys to the apartments. He's, oh, 
let's go rob somebody. I go, Henry, that's a different <laughs> life. That's not what we do today. Damn, man. He came here, and we're going to write a couple of pages, and I wrote three pages, gave it to him, and then he took it to a company called Kushner Lock, and they wound up making a movie called Get Gotti. Get Gotti, not Getting. Yeah. And uh, Lorraine Bracco played the prosecutor that I knew. And it was a terrible movie. It wasn't very good. It's the <laughs> movie of the week. And we got some money. And that was it. Yeah. Well, you know, if anybody hasn't checked out our episode we did yesterday. Well, it just came out yesterday. It's the one with Sal was in Lewisburg with Henry Hill, Tommy D. Simone, and Angelo Ruggiero. And we talk about what it was like being in there with these guys and, you know, Next week will be our last Lewisburg episode, and that one covers Jerry Langella and Larry Zanino. Zanino, and uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it, we're kind of finalizing up on that whole series because we we've covered a lot of the guys that Sal was in there with. And yeah, we want to you know give insight stories of you know Sal can give that that's not known to the public, and so you know Sal just kind of briefly met some of these guys in there, and there's not a whole lot of information that we can really go off of that he knew personally besides speaking with him playing card games and stuff so we'll make a playlist and if you haven't watched all those you can check them out and i think it was pretty good though i mean how do you yeah. feel about wrapping up on that series now it's all good it's all good <laughs> yeah well and also i what did i drop this week oh thursday i put out an interview with a mob associate that i did probably back in the early january february and it's coming out now with anthony Cayucci, i believe is his last name and that was a really good one and if you haven't checked it out you know just go to our page and you know you can see it there and you know it's also you know we've got a couple new patreon subscribers sal over there that it signed up this week too man so if you guys want more exclusive uh episodes and videos from me and sal just go over there subscribe and you can chat back and forth with sal on there but uh what do you feel, Sal? You ready to wrap up on here? You got anything yeah, else? Yeah, I enjoy uh, answering the questions. I hope we'll have some more fun uh, next week. I don't know what we're going to do. Next week is Christmas Eve, so we'll yeah. see what we come up with. But um, as Dean Martin used to say, keep those letters and cards coming in. <laughs> <laughs> All our fans. Yeah. Oh, this was uh, top feed Coco said Adrian. I really in, in, enjoyed that interview I did with that Anthony. Yeah, well, thank you. I, <laughs> that was way back in at the beginning of this year. I yeah. had you know the braids in and stuff, the cornrows. That's you know our yeah. first interview. That's what I had too, the, and the, the yeah. braids and everything from the beginning. Maybe we can find someone who can talk about the Sinatra Club aside from me. That would be fun if we could get a hold of somebody who knew Tommy Block. So we'd probably <laughs> laugh, you know at. And stuff all the, that went on 50 years ago. Well, even that, you know, John Red Collins Sr., I mean, he, he he's yeah. not interested in going on shows or anything. But yeah, just the fact that the son reached out and said that his dad yeah. knew. He, 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 he said he went in there before. He went in there. and I, I, See, I, guess I don't I remember him coming in there because most of the guys I do remember coming in there were there all the time. They yeah. couldn't wait to get there and they didn't want to leave. But, I mean, I don't remember a lot about Red. It was amazing how... We went on one heist together, and I never saw him again. It was just just that way, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. One more comment here from Lee. He said, "Once once again, great shows, guys." Well, thank you. Thank Lee. you. Thanks, Lee. I'll play our you know little promotional ad before we close out. We got a few. Hope uh, purchase all of these items. If you would like to support our podcast, we got a few items that you can purchase. All of these items can be found in the video description below. The first one is Sal's book, The Sinatra Club. You can get this personally autographed by Sal. The next one in our hottest seller is the 1972 Sinatra Club playing cards. Back in Sal's Mafia days, he opened up his own social club named the Sinatra Club. Many mobsters would come to this club, even when there were all-out wars going on between different families. They would come to the Sinatra Club and play cards. Some of the mobsters that played with these cards were John Gotti, Dominic Cataldo, Tommy D. Simone, Foxy, Jimmy Burke, Willie Boyd Johnson, Tony Roach, 
Henry Hill, Joe Defiti, Danny Fatico, Gene Gotti, Peter Gotti, Joey Scopo, and many more. We're selling each one of these cards for $10 a piece. These cards are limited. We only got a thousand of them. The next item is an autographed picture of Sal from his Mafia days. Another item is the Dinner with the Mobster card. You can get this autographed as well. This was an event that Sal had hosted in the past. We also got the Ubots production ticket from an event that Sal had hosted. This is also autographed. The last item we got to offer is Sal's book, The Sins of the Father. Again, you can find all these items in the video description below. I was going to bring up this one comment here, too. Yeah. Uh, Mystery Girl says uh, Anthony Ruggiano mentioned the Sinatra Club a few times. Well, you know, Anthony lived on 88th Street, like a couple of hundred yards away from where I live. But when he was a kid, he would go across the street to the pizza joint, which was Sal's Pizza, my pizza joint in the 60s. And then in the 70s, I guess Anthony must have been maybe, I'm trying to think how old he was. Let's see. What was he, 10 years younger than you? Yeah, maybe he was 20. Yeah, he might have been, I'm trying to think. No, I think he might have been 16 or 17. And mm -hmm. Anthony played in the park, played ball with his brother, Albert. Uh, so he knew it existed, yeah. But I don't remember him coming in. I know Andy, his father, did not come into no. Scotch Club. No, he didn't. No. Yeah, well, I mean, that's still interesting that he brought it up. He's another person that would have, you know, seen it or not been in there, I suppose. But, yeah, yeah that's cool. I, I didn't know that. So like, yeah. you know, I think he was 16 or 18 when, when we had the Sinatra Club. We had it for three years, so. Well, yeah, and there's other people that watch yeah. all these other podcasts. Yeah, we, we got... We got naysayers. They go, well, how come nobody knew about it? Well, they just didn't. Nobody wrote about it. It wasn't this big, popular nightclub. No, you know? <laughs> it wasn't a nightclub like Studio Fifty Four. No, not at yeah. all. Well, no, I was just saying that. You know, there's yeah. people that watch these uh, the other guys that are yeah. you know, doing stories and stuff. So they they right. provide this information. I mean, we I mean you don't sit down and watch every one show. I mean, we, we got no, I don't shows. watch any shows. <laughs> we got our own to do. We're busy enough. Yeah. With, so. I mean, you know, that's cool, though. I mean, that, that's a good way to close out. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Cool. And, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll see you next week, and we'll also see you when we drop our next episode. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Okay. Let me end that. Yeah.